Okay, we'll keep it. We're live. Hello, we everybody. Live. <laughs> hey, everybody. It's Jane Johnston with Bear Hill Group at Remax Coast. And I am here about to show a condo at 770 Herald Street. And I love, uh, I love my co host. Hey, everybody. It's Andrew Go Plank. Ahead. I love your angle there where you're showing, you know, the background of, through the sunroof of your car, a place you're about to view. <laughs> and I'm that's, tethered to my my phone. That's money. Money there. Good job. <sighs> so, yeah. uh, well, let's, how was your week? Uh, busy week. Uh, again, you know, really uh, uh, frustrating for all the buyers and, uh, you know, happiness for sellers, generally speaking. And um, it's got a lot of, a lot of buyers are starting to get, my buyers are starting to get pretty frustrated, um, uh -huh. beyond frustrated. Let's put it that way. Because I've been saying they've been frustrated for a while, but now it's beyond frustrated. Still finding some stuff, though. Yeah. How well, I'm, uh, I'm finding a lot of buyers are coming in. It's funny. I showed a great place yesterday, and um, the buyer was like, I can't make a decision because I haven't seen enough properties. And so right. today we're going to look to see more properties and there aren't any to see. So I had a list of 10 and I think I'm down to three. So it's a bit, uh, you know, it's tough. Yeah. I mean, you, um, your client says, can we go see a bunch of properties? Here's my list. And you look at the list and you see that of that list, maybe half of them have already been reviewing offers, you know, the day or the day before when they're under contract or they're looking at offers you know, at four o'clock today and you just don't have time to get out there with your client. And then the rest, um, you know, they're tenanted, they're unavailable. You end up with, yeah, three out of 10, pretty standard. Yeah. And then you get a really frustrated buyer because um, their urgency level then goes higher, right? Yeah. I've been so. fantasizing about like, this would never work, but, uh, and it's not really realistic, but, um, you know, if buyers went on strike. There's, there's, I, I know well, buyers are feeling that way. I went to show a property yesterday and I said to the buyer, if we think it's overpriced, you just wait. And then um, like, if you're okay with not getting this house, we just wait and then we can uh, offer on it later. And if you're not okay um, with it, then we have to offer on it now. But you're looking at the property when it's priced here. So therefore they're going to expect you to pay what their listing price is if it's day two on the market. But if it's too much money, then we have to wait for the price to come down. That happens a lot in foreclosures too, right? In foreclosures for sure. You know, I, there was one property I showed some clients. We didn't end up writing on it, but it had been on market for 1.25 um, for about a week. And then they dropped the price by a hundred thousand. Um, Presumably, they didn't get offers on offer day. Um, they were holding off offers, I believe. So they dropped it by 100,000, reset the offer day, and then they ended up with, um, I think it was five or five offers last night and accepted an unconditional offer. Um, but in between that, you know, uh, I feel like there was an opportunity, perhaps. You know, there are some overpriced listings out there. And um, uh, then they're, they're fairly obviously overpriced. And maybe those are the ones that deserve us to be writing on. So rather than having 10 or 15 offers on a property that's underpriced, um, you know, go in under value on one that's overpriced and see what happens. At least you start the conversation. Hey, Kale. <laughs> I'm hoping to get you an open house soon, Kale. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, uh, first of all, let's go over the stats and then we can go over um what our topic is today, which is backup offers and uh, why they're good or bad. So yeah, take it away, okay. Danielle. We're Need looking it. for the stats <laughs> on the screen. Hold on. Three, two, one. <laughs> uh, yes. Open houses it. are buzzing at the moment, Kale, but what you want to do is make sure you, you make them effective. That's the key. Kale is good. Kale's a, a colleague and he's really um, knows the open house like he rocks doing the open houses. And uh, 
He, um, he contacts me every time I've got a new listing. And unfortunately, none of mine have really had the opportunity for an open house for him. And I've got a new one coming up, Kale, but it also, they don't want to do open houses. We'll get you one though. It's, it's a mission now. Okay, I have the stats on my screen. So um, we are at year, uh, month to date. So it's the 18th. Um, we have 389 net unconditional sales. That's compared to 990 for October last year. Uh, 480 new listings compared to uh, 1,162 last year. And active listings were at 1,109, and that's compared to 2,122. So we're down. Oh, my God. There we are. Thanks, Danielle. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on a second. This is, this is the blooper edition. <laughs> Jane, Jane usually runs these things, but she's uh, she's got a showing. So yeah. Just take it down, Danielle. <laughs> that's good. Keep it up. I like it. Anyway, um, it's interesting because active listings down almost to 1,100. Um, uh, next week, probably under 1,100 active listings. Um, and what's interesting too, actually, Danielle, do bring it back up if you don't mind. Uh, doing the market watch at the very top there, new listings, 177 new listings versus pending 189. We had more sale properties sell than we had come on market. So, um, we're going to continue to see that number drop uh, if this trend continues. 23 price increases, though, that's good news for some folks. People are uh, overshooting the market, apparently. Um, eight increases, again, maybe that's an, a situation where um, there was, uh, they feel like they missed the market, they got too much activity, and they decided to uh, uh, really course correct really quick. Um, one back on market, 187 uh, changed hands in the last week, 18 expired, and one was withdrawn. Right. Okay. And actually, I did see one canceled and relisted, and it was relisted higher. You can get rid of the stats now. And can you put the uh, label on, please? <laughs> Excellent. So that was the stats. Thanks, everyone. Um, and uh, today we wanted to talk about uh, backup offers and uh, maybe the pros and cons of getting a backup offer accepted. Uh, how to make that work, why it may not be a bad idea, why it might be a bad idea, all that good stuff. And then Jane, actually, um, I know you have to run early today, but if we do uh, run out of uh, topic for that, uh, we can just expand that to talk about any conditions that maybe are um, uh, a little off the wall or on normal, like or ones that are subject are are um, are for the buyer, the seller's uh, benefit. Okay, well, let's just do backup. I think we have enough time. Okay, good. <laughs> So uh, what a backup offer is, is uh, for a seller, it's a great thing because it's uh, an offer that comes in after the first offer and it's negotiated separately from the first offer with one condition, which is it's subject to the first offer uh, collapsing on or before a certain date. So if you have an offer, let's say it's the 18th. So let's say it's, it's open till the 28th of October you can accept a backup offer and that would go into play uh, the 29th. So if the first offer collapses, the second offer would automatically go into play. So benefit for the seller, Andrew. Well, it benefits the seller in that they have an offer in there. They have a backup right in their pocket. They don't have to go right back to market and go back to trying to get and gather up more offers. There's someone right there ready, willing and able to go. I'll just correct one thing. It doesn't always an unconditional backup offer. And the buyers can, doesn't don't always have no conditions. A backup offer can be. No, I didn't mean that. Oh, okay. I mean, it, but it has it. You negotiate it separately, and it has an additional con condition. Uh, an additional condition, and on top of potentially any other buyer conditions, and that additional condition is for the seller's benefit. Yes, great. Um, sorry, it just came across the other way, so I wanted to make sure that was clarified. That's okay. Um, so where that often happens is, um, you know, a property that may be, I mean, if you're the seller and your property has gone to, to market and gone to offers and you've received lots of multiple offers, you know, lots of offers, and um, one of the offers is a higher price than the others by a long shot, but it has a number of conditions. You really want to take that, but you also don't want to risk that offer falling apart and then having to go back to negotiations and maybe not reach that kind of price point again. 
or even the price point of some of the other offers, which may even be unconditional. So if you take that, that first offer, it's a good idea to try to um, ask some of these other folks that were really wanting to make an offer to, to consider a backup, and especially if those offers were unconditional. So when the advantage is for the seller is sometimes, uh, let's say something happens in the conditions, the seller, let's say they find vermiculite in the attic or whatever, then the first offer cannot be changed and it pushes it through because if you start negotiating, renegotiating the first offer, you've opened it up. And uh, generally, uh, that's not um, a good thing because then the seller can just say bye bye. And so you just want to, uh, the seller, the buyer will usually just push the offer through. So that, so sometimes when you do a backup offer, you're actually pushing the first offer through. Sometimes be, finan yeah. Yeah. financing can be an issue with the first buyer. And if financing is an issue and you come in with a backup offer and you have like a very strong buyer, you, you will say, you know what, my the financing, if it is true, is very strong and this is not going to be an issue for this buyer. This is uh, particularly important in properties that are kind of, I would say, marginalized, like um, they may have strange requirements that need better financing. Uh, like a strata hotel or something like that, um, which can't get conventional financing or it's over a million dollars and they need 20% down, all these things. So uh, you can, uh, sometimes uh, when you write an offer and it's conditional on financing, the buyer maybe doesn't have all their ducks in a row and they have to get them in a row. And uh, this is one reason why you want to have everything pre-approved before you go to write the offer so that um, you don't fall into this. So the second offer will just like come in and say, I got it, right? Yeah, so um, when you write an offer, a backup offer, it does sometimes put pressure on the first offer. And that's what Jane was saying. The first offer has less leeway to negotiate or maneuver if something is found on inspection or if they have a problem with their financing because that, <laughs> second offer may be higher for example than the first offer and the seller may actually not want to give that extension that they would if they didn't have somebody in their back pocket they would consider an extension if the first set buyer came to them and said you know hey i need another couple of days for my financing but with a backup offer and especially if that backup offer is in a higher price point it's going to put some pressure on the seller on the sorry on the first buyer to either um, buy the place as it is or and remove their conditions or, or get out of the way. Yeah. So it's best to get releases and, and all of that um, from, of contract from all the parties um, for the first offer to come into play. Now, an interesting one, Jane, is um, the, the whole idea of, you know, subject to the first, the, the seller no longer being obligated in any way to the first accepted offer is usually some of the language uh, in this backup offer. Where it gets kind of muddy is, you know, you know, if if the seller does want to give an extension, if the seller does want to negotiate price a little bit and keep that first offer in play, um, because maybe it's a little bit higher money than the second offer. And, you know, how much leeway do they have to make that happen if they do accept a backup offer? And so I would suggest can. people, I mean, I've had, I've, ha I've been given advice both ways, but I would mm -hmm. definitely talk to your managing broker before you pursue that we are not lawyers exactly and some language in some of these backup offers make it really clear that the seller will not negotiate any changes to the existing contract and um and otherwise it gets a little bit more murky right so the advantage for, for a buyer in a backup offer is uh you don't often like if you're in a hot property and Offer A, let's say it's a development property. There's one in the Squamalt right now that's pretty hot property. And it had an offer that uh, the first offer collapsed. There was a backup offer. The backup offer went into play. And now the sellers are saying, if you guys want to have a new backup offer, we can do that. 
And the advantage is that you may not be competing against other offers, but the seller will try and negotiate you up to where the first offer was. So let's say the property is priced at 800 and the first offer is uh, 810 in multiple offers or whatever. The, the backup offer, they will also try to negotiate up to that 810 if they can. They want it to be as good as the first offer, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where it's an advantage or disadvantage for buyers is uh, as well, you know, once you make that offer and you get accepted in a backup position, you don't know if you've actually bought the property for a little while. You are waiting for that first buyer to get out of the way or go forward. If they get out of the way, you immediately slot into the position of having an accepted offer and doing your due diligence if you haven't already done it. If they if they if they go ahead and buy the first buyers, then you are now you've been off the market for a week or so without the benefit of being able to buy another property because you really don't want to put yourself in a position of having agreed to buy more than one property at a time. So you take yourself off the market a little bit when you go in a backup position. But the benefit of it is, um, you know, time as time moves on, more properties get seen, more interest in the property. If you can get yourself even in a backup position on a property, especially if it's the property for you, it's worth the wait because not every property, not every offer goes forward, not every buyer can get their financing, not every buyer is satisfied with the building inspection. Um, there are things that happen in the meantime that make them go away. And uh, you then don't have to, if that offer were to fall apart and you weren't in a backup position, you were just waiting to see what happened, that offer might fall apart. And then the seller says, okay, great, let's, let's relaunch this listing, let's do a price change, let's, um, let's get some more activity on this, let's hold off offers again. And maybe it goes back to a price even higher than you could have had as a backup. Yeah, because you're going to avoid that again. competition. Yes. Yeah. But as you said, you're taken off the market. So sometimes what, and you know, this is dependent on your level of risk and also your agent's level of risk and their their relationship with the other realtor and how well they communicate and how well the listing realtor communicates. Um, often like in a heated offer situation where you have two great offers and uh, but neither one is unconditional. The listing agent may say, do you want to be in a backup position? And so what they would do, how they would do that is, let's say, taking the offer on October 18th and it's open until uh, the conditions are, are uh, removal date is the 28th, okay. is they would then say, OK, you you can actually start removing your conditions at the same time if you want to spend the money and the time or you could have your conditions uh, removal date like a week after. But uh, let's just talk about actually um, uh, subject to sale offers because subject to sale offers have a 24 hour clause, which somebody can write a backup offer on that and remove their condition. So um, yeah. depending on how the contract's written, the first offer will have time to remove their conditions and then they'll have a um, subject to sale with a 24, 48 or 72 hour clause. So Jane, Eugene, you're talking about a specialized kind of situation where backup offers can, another situation where backup offers can be pretty powerful. And that's where someone has said, I, I wanna buy this house, but I have a house to sell. So I'll buy it if I can sell my own. And the seller will often agree to that provided um, that they can include a stipulation that they can still look at other offers and take a backup offer, but not only take a backup offer, but that backup offer can become the primary offer because it triggers, as Jean said, uh, what's called a time clause, this 24 or 48 or 72 hour period where this, the first buyer has to decide if they are gonna remove conditions even if their home hasn't sold and go forward. And if they don't, then that secondary offer just slots immediately into place. Right. And so that, and, but the, um, in order to give the notice, the second offer has to be unconditional. So at that time you can be removing your conditions the same time as the first offer is removing their conditions. And then you, you can just say like on the 10th day, yeah. uh, Hey, I want it or not <laughs> because right. we want it. <laughs> right. So, so 
Yeah, and oftentimes in that case, a backup offer doesn't have to be the full price as the other offer because a backup offer that's not conditional on sale might be considered more valuable than, than an offer that is, um, you know, dependent on the sale of a house. Um, and, however, uh, however, mm-hmm. in, a, in a backup offer, um, if somebody has an offer subject to sale, the you're right, there may be some consideration, but if the first offer is so good, they may not accept the backup offer unless <laughs> it's better than the first offer. They may go, right. you know what? I have an offer of a million bucks and you have an offer of 800,000. So we're going to stick with the first offer. Well, yeah. I mean, there's, there's definitely those considerations to take into account and, and the, the seller will definitely not want, if, if there's a, if, if they wouldn't want that to be triggered, that time clause to be triggered, they're not going to accept that, that that other offer. No, it has to be compelling enough for it to, to work. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, backup offers can be um, beneficial. I've had some really good success with them for my buyers in the past. Um, one of the things that we find in real estate is, uh, you know, when I have a listing uh, and it's under contract and there's conditions for, let's say, the next week for the buyer to do their building inspections and financing and so forth. Uh, at that period, I'm going to get some showing requests from people or some inquiries from other agents saying, you know, is this still available? Is this still available? And when I reply, it's under contract with conditions due next Friday, they'll say, okay, let me know if it falls apart. They won't come and view it. And they'll just want to know if it falls apart. And so you end up with this, you build up this dam of this, 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 this energy of people who, if it does fall apart, you've got to call as a listing agent and say, hey, it's falling apart. And now everybody is jumping over themselves and scrambling to get through the home and to make an offer potentially. Whereas yeah. the, the savvy agent and the savvy buyer who does go and look at that property and sees it and says, okay, you know what? We like this and we're going to make a backup offer. They probably that's a judgment more- call. I just want to say that's a judgment call on the savvy agent because they may be, they may be um, a time. It, it's a time related issue because the savvy agent may not have time to view um, properties with conditions. There's somebody on the wall there. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. I saw that they're, they're cleaning <laughs> windows. It's like a monkey. <laughs> <laughs> Spider-Man. <me> out. Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> so, so like I, so what I say to the listing agent depends on the buyer again, and depends on what's out there. Every, you know, there's no right or wrong, right? There's no right or wrong, but there's strategies and some of them uh, in different markets and different situations. And, and the, the main point of this is just understanding that these are options available to people yeah. and, um, and they don't always work. And uh, it's important to at least know your options. And I have, again, seen some pretty good success now it, a lot of work making backup offers that may never go anywhere but when you know you want when you have a one in 20 chance of making an offer in a competing of, of getting an offer accepted in a competing situation and there's maybe a one in 10 chance of a uh, conditional offer falling apart then being in a backup position is perhaps better odds um, yeah and also um what I say to buyers too, if we have time, so again, it's the time issue is if we have time, then what we can do is go and see the property. And then if it sells, then you know what the market is saying in terms of the value. Agreed. Yeah. That's all part of, even if it's under contract, be able to see it and see what it eventually sold for. It's a lot, uh, your, your internal, uh, your ring in. Your I internal guess, sense sorry. of value is is much increased by actually seeing these properties as opposed to just seeing them on paper. And you and I both know that uh, the experience of viewing a property is much different than seeing it on the listing. Uh, sometimes they look much better. Sometimes they look much worse. Or there's yeah. something about it. So you'll understand why it went for the price it did and get yeah. a sense of what things are going for. Anyway. And the thing is, is once... Um, so here's how you know the market is starting to shift is if those back if the initial offers actually do start collapsing you know that um you know the buyer may have seen another property that they prefer or there's something wrong with the property that they're not willing to let go then move on with like there's lots of reasons why 
offers collapse. But when um, in a fast market where people are feeling really confident, they uh, won't release that offer because their bet is, despite the problems that they found maybe during a home inspection, the prices are still going to go up. But in, um, in a slower market, you'll see offers. It's, it takes like maybe two or three offers for an offer to go through. Right. Right. Yeah. The buyers have more choice and they are, uh, can afford to be more picky and they have the benefit of time being on their side. If properties are, if property prices are stable or even going down, then, uh, then why not be extra picky? And uh, when prices are going up, then um, you might be picky about a $5,000. Uh, you might not want to be picky about a $5,000 repair if prices are going up because you then go back to looking at other properties on market and in another week values might have gone up by 10 grand on average uh, exactly so yeah maybe not that quickly but it does happen fast right now yeah so Again, um you've got a showing to do i do it's uh, it's in half an hour but i do have a question what new mm -hmm. listings do you have coming up i've got a listing coming at uh 1629 Camosun street uh, it's a 1904 built home, uh, really nice. It's got great character and uh, just a lot of charm to it. It's really beautifully landscaped, uh, beautifully cared for, uh, nice high ceilings inside, 10 foot ceilings, I believe they are. It might be nine, but I think they're 10 foot. Uh, great bedroom, three beds, two baths, a little office, a big outbuilding. Um, it's a, a so pretty much a two car garage. Uh, heated, not heated, but um, insulated and wired. And it looks like it's actually plumbed and it's in a section, an area, a corner property. It allows for a larger than average um, uh, uh, garden suite. So, so with variants that might be available. 1.1 it's going up at. And uh, it's going to list this Thursday. Um, uh, I've got photos and floor plans I'm all organizing right now. And uh, yeah, we'll be looking at offers uh, the following Wednesday. Cheap. How about you, Jay? <laughs> Did you say cheap? Um, I said shoot. <laughs> shoot. Ah. I have a buyer. <laughs> um, I have a property coming up. It's, um, you know, a traditional 1960s BC box in uh, Saanich Gen 1924 Blackthorn. Uh, the price is going to be around a million. I'm not sure exactly. Beautifully kept home. It has a pool. A pool. Uh, so Okay. Yep. Three built in. Built in. Three beds yeah. up and um, a cheater ensuite upstairs, and then another bathroom and a bedroom downstairs, and it has a rec room, and it's main level entry, so you could um, build an accessible suite downstairs if you want. It's on a large lot too, which is really nice. So it has a big green grassy area, and this family's really enjoyed this this property over a long time. I love that area. I think it's. Um... It's a great, you know, great value for the money compared to what else is around. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of an undiscovered um, area. So, yep, that's where we're at for now. Um, and yeah, I have my listing at the Oswego Hotel. If anybody's interested at Strata Hotel, it's so you're guaranteed income. Um, very, it's been around since 2007. So, established hotel mm -hmm. and um i have a beautiful three bed or two bedroom townhouse on Brittany in colwood which is two bedroom two bath and it's 1500 square feet it has a single car garage and it's located right beside the galloping goose trail and like within those. walking distance to west shore yeah. mall yeah. yeah are those ages those are not age restricted they are they're 55 plus right yeah but still a great a great little retirement complex for someone um, yeah. So yeah, love that. Um, good job. Yeah. So then buyers wise, um, how are you finding it? I mean, I've got buyers for pretty much all areas of Victoria, but mostly I'd say the most desperate right now is um, um, sort of Sanitary West and View Royal looking for a single family home potentially with a suite. Um, and I'm also looking for a single family home in the Gordon Head area. Doesn't necessarily have to have a suite, but um, Anything under 1.2 million for either of those? Uh, so I have, yeah, lots of buyers right now. Yeah. You know, and 
unfortunately they're looking for popular product in Victoria and um, Sanities. So I do find buyers come to the city. They love Fairfield. Then they love Oak Bay. Then they love Sandage East and they go up the east side or mm -hmm. they're like west of the highway, but they don't cross. I think so. it depends on, um, you know, if you've got the money, people tend to want to stay on the east side. Although I think there's so many great elements of the west. But when you're thinking value conscious, you're going to go a little more west or we just don't have the money to go to the east side. Um, yeah. There's some song about the east side versus west side, isn't there? But anyway, <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, I, I feel like there are some, you know, versus what you'd pay to get into Oak Bay, there's some really great value out there because prices in Oak Bay have just gone pretty nuts. Well, many people in Oak Bay are buying in surprisingly... Um, uh, Langford in Bear Mountain. So there you go. Interesting. That seems odd. Where are you hearing this? Uh, because I, I've had listings in both places and the, I see the same people at open houses. At the Very open houses. Yeah. Are they going to townhouses and condos in, in Bear Mountain or are they buying houses? They're buying houses that don't need any work. Right. Okay. So they're just tired of, of those 1940s <laughs> houses. Flooding that... basements. Right. Low height flooding basements. Okay. Okay. There you go. There's still no village in, um, in Bear Mountain though, that I, I find is kind of, that's the missing, missing yeah, element of Bear Mountain. I agree. Until they, they get that. Once they have that, I think it's, it'll be great. It's so, on its way. Yeah, it is. All things come. Okay. My and, main man. Yep. Great. Well, uh, thanks everybody for watching and I hope you pick something up. If you have any questions, as always, you can reach uh, Jane or I. Jane, how would we reach you? Uh, so you can reach me at the Briar Hill Group. Thank you, Danielle. <laughs> Briarhillgroup.com. You can reach me at my phone number at 250-744-0775. And um, by the way, you can now listen to these on the podcast of Vancouver Island Time. And uh, any podcast that you listen to, uh, please subscribe. We had very many uh, downloads last week, but we transferred all these to the that podcast, by the way, Andrew. Excellent. So Excellent. Yeah, Daniel sent me a note about that. That's exciting. Yeah. Um, and so, so, and so you, you can, can you... Uh, yeah, reach Andrew at? You can reach Andrew at, uh, you can reach me at 250-360-6106. Email me info at andrewplank.com or check out my website. Lots of resources there, andrewplank.com. Jane, it's like you've had a little guy on your shoulder there. Um, you're washing your, yeah, there he is. Well, <laughs> little Ant-Man. You should see if you can wash your windows. You've got a lot of, <laughs> you've got a lot of windows there. All right, everybody, take care. Thanks, everybody. See you have later. See you next Bye. week.